that is uh, one, and this is the other one which I sold is the survival terrain in Strasi. You can see here, these are the antennas, it's just uh, fixed to here. So that can be, that also gives you, this you can see the microchip antenna. Here, here there we had both the VHF as well as S-band. S-band we used the survival terrain, VHF we are used the monopoles. This we have used in a satellite called Strasi, which is very influent in the AS area of it. This is the one which I told that is a satellite recovery payload experiment. You can see the antennas here. You see the two different areas because uplink and downlink are different. Uplink is at uh, 2 to 2.1, downlink is 2.2 to 2.3. In this particular case, uh, we have made two separate arrays because the, uh, this bandwidth requirement was uh, very stringent. And uh, the, we could not accommodate, see, well, if, uh, in microchip antennas, there are two methods of increasing the bandwidth. One method is to increase the thickness of the substrate. That is one very important thing. So that you can get some better. And second thing is to go for a very low directly constraint. Here, what happens is in this particular case, the space structure did not allow us to increase the thickness locally. So it has to be a very thin structure. So very thin structure means your bandwidth is hardly 3 to 4 percent. And that is not sufficient for our uh, thing. So what we did is we thought, okay, we can put two separate arrays, one array for uh, uplink, one array for downlink. So this is what uh, we have used, and this is the uh, is under test. The full uh, this is a part of that full uh, satellite recovery payload experiment which we sent. It went to, to the orbit, and after that it came back, and we retrieved it. So these are the actual ones. Sir, what is the better requirement? What is the better requirement? What is the exact frequency? Frequency. This same S band. Okay. S band. Bandwidth. What is the bandwidth? Bandwidth. Actually, it is two to two point one hundred megahertz band. But we don't require that full 100 megahertz bandwidth. We require much less. But if you have to use the same antenna for both uplink as well as downlink, so what is the uplink frequency? 2 to 2.1, sorry. 2 to 2.1. Downlink frequency is 2.2 to 2.3. So if you want to use a single line patch array from 2 to 2.3, you require a 300 megahertz bandwidth. So for 300 megahertz bandwidth, the you can easily make, uh, in, like we have done the corridor helix etc, no problem. Because there is a 100 megahertz band there. No, no, we can always do that. But the problem in this particular spacecraft was, the thickness was not available at that place. Otherwise, we would have made, we would have built one or the other and built. There, that uh, the spacecraft engineer has told that we cannot have anything uh, more than a small strip. Ah. Yes. So one band will be 2 to 2.1, another band is 2.2 to 2.5. We, 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 can, we can do that. So you can interlace, yeah. interlace and do that. If you interlace in this particular case, what will happen is, if the number of elements are less in that, the ripple will be more. Yeah, ripple will be so we wanted to have that also. So since the place was available, we thought, and one more advantage is, here you don't require diplexer. Straight to connect to transmitter, straight to connect to receiver. If you have a single unit, you have to connect through a diplexer. So the diplexer is not required here. So by weighing all those things, here in this case, we did like that. That's how we did that. This, this is the actual antenna pattern. You see, somewhere else it has gone up, somewhere else it is down, etc. See, this global beam antenna, I told you, Johnson, we use it for uh, geostationary satellites after the satellite has reached the geostationary orbit for PDC purpose. We directly because we don't want to use a huge omni antenna, it is not really required. Because the purpose it is because once it is there, it is going to point always only to one direction. So it is really not required. So we change over to the global hand antenna because one main important thing is we can go to a low power mode of transmitter. See, transmitter we give two modes one is called high power mode, one is called a low power mode. The high power mode is connected to the omni antenna, which is very wide beam. The low power mode is connected to the global antenna because the global antenna itself has got a gain of about 18, 90 dB. 90 dB is quite a high gain. So it is very essential uh, that we can change over from this to that mode and we uh, use the global antenna for coverage for the TTC purpose in this. So here, yeah, the frequency uh, is not being really used for downlink. It is 3.1 to 4.2. Two gigahertz is the downlink, but uplink generally we don't go to any global harm. We continue with the omni antenna itself, always in general. But there is no hard and fast rule why we should not do it. But there the power saving is not much. Receiver power is not much different. Whereas in transmitter, if we are using a two watt, three watt power, or five watts of power, the power saving is there. DC power saving is there. 
that DC power you can use it somewhere else. So that is one of the reasons only for uh, downlink we go back to home, uh, global horn antenna. Whereas the Omni uh, for uplink we don't change over. So here that is uh, here the this uh, free kind of gain is 19 dB plus. Whereas that is almost zero dB gain. So you get a fantastic gain here. And uh, over three dB bandwidth it will just uh, come down by three. So it will have 19 dB to 16 dB variation in the gain. That's all. So and the what we do is we bring down the power from about 3.54 watts to almost half a watt of power. So that much power reduction we do, but because the antenna gain is high, your overall EARP, that is the effective isotropic radiated power will be quite high. So that we can use. So that for this we use the horn. This is the actual horn which is made and you can see the pattern here. How beautiful is this pattern? This is the antenna addition. This is the 70 degrees being bit. The gain has been 19.5. And here we can have two, uh, two uh, polarizations. What I do is one polarization I'll connect to one transmitter, other polarization I can connect to other transmitter. Here we use a polarizer called a septum polarizer where there is a waveguide and in between there is a septum. And the uh, two sides of the spec, septum, you will get the two circular polarization. That is how we generate them. And here directly, so dual circular we can have. And the axial ratio is very good, is less than 1 dB. And the whole weight of the antenna is less than a kg because this full flare which you see is made out of a point 3 mm thick aluminum sheet. You, if you make out of a solid uh, block, it first of all machining cost itself is very high because this aperture is about 300. This, uh, if you want to uh, do it from such a huge block and machine them out, it is a very expensive process at the same time not uh, advisable. So what we do is we make it, take a sheet, aluminum sheet, say is a alloy sheet, aluminum alloy sheet which is we, we, we use is called a 6061 aluminum alloy sheet. You just envelop them neatly and then make sure that it is perfectly fixed and then at the junction you bond them. See so once you envelop them, there is a junction point. You make a nice overlap and then bond them. So there are special bonding materials available called epoxy epoxies from uh, uh, this thing specific company called, uh, called Epotec. Their uh, uh, addresses are all qualified for space. So you, uh, you nicely bond them, cure it at 100 degrees or 150 degrees depending on what uh, this one you use. And it will be very intact and the whole thing, but well, then only the flare portion you have to do that. This portion is an easy machine. No, you fix this or to this and the whole thing you put it in a oven and nicely cure it. And it becomes an integral part of the antenna. So here what we do is, on the spacecraft, we will be moved somewhere here at this flange. So that this wavegate portion is inside this spacecraft, directly get connected to the transmitter from here. And then this portion only is uh, popping out for the, uh, this, as the antenna. Structurally also, if you mount here, the structural uh, this thing, the vibration, which will, this tip will undergo will be much more. Whereas if you fix it here, the vibration can, coming at this place will be much less. So mechanically also, it is better to have an intermediate location where you can fix the spacecraft, uh, which, which we can fix the antenna. This is a, when you see the pattern, almost you see no uh, back load. So the entire energy is on this one. This is a quarter half. What where we can have the uh, two, you see, you know, see, normally a circular waveguide has got TE11. So, in that, if you add TM01 also, what will happen? It will directly give you the uh, uh, this one, the uh, energy in such a way that almost it is uniform, there will be no curling effect. So, because of that, you get a very good efficiency, and finally, the pattern comes as good as this. So, you can say the side loads uh, are less than 40 dB, and almost there is no back load. So it's a very good, uh, excellent antenna pattern. So this is only when you pro plot it onto the map, what will happen, how it will look like. So that's what it is showing. So then we, from the TTC, we now move to another major area which is called the data transmission. As I told, all our imaging satellites will carry a major imaging payload which will have very high data rate. The data rates can be as low as uh, uh, say few megabits of data, 5 to 10 megabits of data or it can be as high as 100, 100 megabits of data and now we are going in for uh, 500, 600 megabits data or even up to 1, 1 1.2 GB data. In which case the, da the data transmission cannot be done with uh, uh, a normal omni antenna type of this or low gain antenna. We require either a medium gain antenna or you can require still higher gain antenna. So what we like to do is in this, 
we have to I guess, show directly in the diagram. So one one important thing which I told is when the satellite moves from horizon to horizon, the slant range will vary from this to the orbital height. This is the orbital height. This is the orbital height of the satellite, and this is the maximum slant range which will have. So this value, this uh, h and this r will be different. So what we can do is we can have an antenna pattern like this. See, we know that if we have an, uh, uh, the orbit of the order, say about 800 kilometers, the angle which the satellite will subtract onto the air will be of the order of about 125 degrees, roughly. This angle. Okay, this will be about 125 degrees or so. Whereas from the geostationary orbit, when you see it is just subtending 17 degrees. This low earth orbiting satellite, if you take from that one point, the angle it would subtract to the earth is of this order. Okay. So this uh, 120 degrees means is about plus minus 62 degrees. That is from horizon to horizon. So what we get to is we know at the maximum slant range, the there is something called path loss. As you know, this path loss is nothing but 4 pi r by lambda whole square. Where r is the slant range. Okay, lambda is the frequency of interest. So, when the path loss is more, so uh, when the when range is more, the path loss is also more. So, what we do is, on, on places where the path loss is more, you give a higher gain of the antenna. And wherever the path loss is less, you give a lower gain. So, you make an antenna, the antenna in such a shape, the antenna beam in such a way that you get like this. So, at this place, you have the maximum slant range, your path loss is more, so you give a higher gain. And this place which is right above our, uh, this thing equal to naught, uh, at the naught that is at the orbital height, the, and the path loss is less. So we can have a low end antenna again. So you make an antenna in such a way that if you have a pattern of this class, you can transmit the data. And this normally we have a gain of about plus 7 dB. And this is really about minus 10 dB less. Minus 10 dB less means uh, about minus 3 dB. Minus 3 dB. This I we normally write to indicate that there is with respect to isotropy. Huh? So that is why in a, so this is what this is how we made. So this is one type of antenna which we made to the medium gain antenna which we used in many of our earlier uh, spacecrafts for directly getting the this one. Here there is no switching, nothing is involved once the antenna is there within that orbital one when it moves, the ground station will directly uh, track and get it. So in this one, one advantage is Directly, this is uh, when the ground station is receiving the signal which the receiver will receive will be nearly constant. Small variations can be there, but nearly it will be constant because the gain and the path loss they get compensated. Gain and path loss, wherever there is maximum path loss, there is a higher gain so that the gain path loss gets compensated so that nearly you get a, a constant signal on the ground. So, this is the first type of uh, data transmission antennas which we made for all our IRS class of satellites. So here this is the actual pattern which you get. So you see here, the gain is maximum here. And here it is supposed to come down and go like this. Instead it has given a small ripple here. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Because of the spacecraft structure we found, some ripples are there. But even, even then, that is not going to matter much. So even if you have a signal of this size, this much, it is sufficient for us. So this is extra margin only. So here instead of being straight like this, and going there has been a small ripple. That's the difference. That difference that we, that is since it is to our advantage, there is not a problem. Okay, so that is how we did it for the first time. And uh, many spacecrafts, initial spacecraft, they carried this way. So here we mostly transmitted data rates of the order of some 20 megabits, 20 megabits of data, etc. So it was not not a problem. We used this. So this is the this one. Basically, how do we make the camera? I'll just show the type of antenna which we use. This particular antenna, what we to, to generate a beam of this nature, what we did is we had a normal gate. This frequency is at 8 to 8.4 is the frequency which we have used for data transmission. Okay. So you take an expand gate. A circular wave gate normally gives you a Gaussian beam. Isn't it? Simple Gaussian beam it will give with a gain of about EV. That is the normal missing of a Gaussian beam. Now this beam, we don't we don't want beam like Gaussian beam. We want beam of this nature. So what we do is we have now disturb the beam. 
So what we do is on the gate, away from the gate, you have a shaping element. You have a shaping element. The shaping element is uh, contoured in such a way. You contour this shaping element in such a way that the rays coming from here can go strike this, come back, and then put a large reflector here, reflect from here, and go back. So in this one, so uh, in, uh, you can make the pattern in such a way. This one in such a way that finally after reflection you get a pattern of this nature. This you can do by, by ray tracing you can do and then arrive at this curvature. So, which one? The shaping structure. Yeah, this shaping structure. Uh, no, this I will show you how the whole thing comes. Now, these are the three elements. So, we require a beam shaping element. We require a guide. These two are connected by using uh, this one. You see, this is the beam shaping element. This is the wave guide. And then, this is, this is a small mechanical structure with which you, you can hold this one. Small struts are used so that this can be held. And then, this is a, this one. So, this is we call a shaping element. This is called the deflector. Or you can also call, say, call as a reflector. But the, actually, really it does is it deflects the beam. So we can say as a deflector, then this one, these three together forms a total length. This photograph of this is shown here, you can see here. So to protect that, we have made a Teflon radar on this. So that is how the whole uh, uh, system is. Here this is a, a reflector, this is the shaping beam is inside this, and this is the wave element. And here again, you can have two polarizations on the two, but generally we use only one polarization because the data transmission we generally do it in one, unless it is demanded in, uh, in some other way, later space car we wanted both polarization, but it is available in both. Uh, but only thing is here, the gain which you get here is of the order of maximum 6 to 7 dB. So it's a very, uh, the gain wise is less, but it does the job because the data rate is not very high. So this is the first type of uh, uh, shaping element antenna which we did for our IRS class of satellites. And this we, as you see here, you can see where it is mounted, you see here, this is the full space card by IRS mounted, P6, where we have mounted antennas here. See, we had four different payloads in this. So, in that bottom of this, some payloads we connected through one antenna, and some payloads we connected through the other antenna. And the frequencies were also different, because we wanted to have a good shaping beam, shaping for both. So, the, for two different frequencies, we used two different antennas. For, for four different payloads, we used two antennas so that we could share the two antennas between the two. Some uh, payloads we sent to one antenna, some payloads we sent data, we sent to the other antenna. So that uh, we could get a very good uh, this thing, picture at a later stage. So we used to say, you can see two antennas being mounted on this space run. And then space run, because this is the uh, phase which views the earth. So directly on the ground station, you can receive the data. So as, as I told here for again the polarization, we use a septum polarizer. Similarly, actually the same shaping, once uh, there, there was a requirement to uh, transmit data in S-band. In S-band, the frequency allotted is, is around 2.5 to 2.8, we can use. So in this uh, frequency band and S-band, we want to see the how the size of the antenna. So huge it is because S band means size will be big, and if you want larger and larger gain, the size will be over. Here in this particular case, what we have done is same. Uh, we, our intention is to get a pattern of this nature. So what we did is we have a we used helix as the source, and then we had a large reflector. This reflector we shaped in such a way that after this reflection, when it gets reinforced, you get a pattern. So here, that is the, this is the helix antenna, this is the shaped reflector. The reflector the size record was very much more. That particular machine, those days which we had, this was somewhere in late 80s, we never, we didn't have a machine which can take care of this particular size. <coughs> so what our mechanical engineer did is, the shaping element, he made in one size, and then this is reasonably plain. So this he made a separate ring, and then these two were joined onto the space plan. Really, but S-band, this junction did not matter much. 
but uh, it is only for one flight we made like that. From the next flight onwards, we made a single unit from here to this end, about 600 mm from Gaia, using a CNC machine. So it was, later on it was possible, because that particular time, we didn't have a machine which would take care of that. It, it, it could take care of only some 300 mm Gaia. So later on we had a machine which can take care of the food. See, this is it for, this is the hills. This top of this is some other one, this one beacon and can be fixed it. Because for uh, the expand data transmission, before the data comes, the ground station wants a beacon to first align. So this is a beacon antenna. This is also a quadruple helix. So you see how tiny it is at X band. The S band is saw slightly bigger and C band. The X band is very, very tiny antenna. So very small antenna. So this we uh, transmitted data rates of the 5 megabits, etc. But this was the only one or two class, two maximum three satellites we used, where the data rates were very low. But later on, the data rates are continuous increasing because he wanted uh, the ground resolution to improve from uh, 36 meters. Now, today we have come to less than a meter. So, if you want to have a lesser and lesser uh, 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 resolution, you have to transmit large amount of data. So, in which case, we, the uh, small gain antennas or medium gain antennas will not do. We have to go first till higher gain antenna. So, in this one, so like uh, now you can see this is an antenna which we have used for Chandrayaan mission. Now Chandrayaan mission we know we have a large number of payloads in Chandrayaan. We have uh, uh, payloads, uh, both imaging payload as well as the uh, other scientific payloads which are there. So all payloads together, then the data comes in and it, it, of course here the data rate is about uh, uh, 16 megabits of data. So this here we have used a dual antenna. This is the antenna, this is a parabolic dish on which we have the feed we have fixed here and the whole thing is gimbaled on a system and, and we get a pattern of this nature. This is a 3D pattern which is generated in the compact antenna test facility which we have. See in uh, test ranges we have different type of test ranges. One test range is a simple anechoic chamber which is, can be taken as a far field. Then you have an outdoor test range where you want to have very large satellite. Suppose a full satellite I want to test using a volumetric model. No, no such rooms will not do. We have to go for outdoor range. So outdoor range we go and then fix the antenna. So that is one range. Third one is the, you can do a near field measurement. Okay, you can have a, this thing and a probe continuously moving so that you can get the near field. From near field you can have a far field transmission and tra transformation then you can use it. And then the one other system is called the compact antenna test range where the whole, uh, this thing is collimated in a very short uh, distance. Uh, the, and you get the far field uh, pattern, uh, you can get the far field conditions in a very short distance. That is why it is called a compact antenna test range. So we have a compact antenna test range in uh, Bangalore and Ahmedabad. And uh, this antenna is being tested there. This is a Chandrayaan antenna which is used for data transmission from Chandrayaan spacecraft to the ground. So this is the, here we used uh, this, this is actually this is an aluminium piece you see. Finally, we, this is an uh, uh, engineering model piece. Finally, we made out of CFRP, that is carbon, uh, because CFRP means carbon fiber is a much better uh, this thing because this is a very lightweight and elegant system, specifically from the temperature excursions point of view, it is very useful. So, that is all we did. This is actual uh, performance. And it had a gain. See here the gain. The gain is about 33 dB. That is the gain of the antenna, because that is what we require. From 4 lakh kilometers, you have to reach Earth, you know. And then we have to have a to a large antenna to receive here. So here we have that DS and deep space network, which is there. Now deep space network, as I, I mentioned, it is there in uh, four, four, one at uh, US, we have one at Goldstone, then we have one at Spain, and uh, already one at Canberra in Australia. So we had now one, one in Bangalore. So Bangalore, we have got 32 meter dish, which can receive this Chandrayaan data. Also, it can be used for other uh, missions, like uh, Mars or any other mission which you send. That same this thing can be used as a measure. So it's called a deep space network antenna. So apart from this, there are cases, you know, in uh, low earth orbiting satellites where we had, a, say, like we had in the earlier space, uh, uh, last few uh, four or five spacecrafts, our uh, ground resolution has improved so much, it has come up to less than a meter. In which case, the data rate need to be sent is an order of uh, 100 megabits or more. And also, in some cases, you now we are going for far beyond 100. It is going to about 500, 600 megabits, and in some cases, if you want to still reduce the resolution, it is going to mega gigabits range. So, in which case, all these types of technology of fixed beam and other things do not work. One thing is we can go to dual GMAL antenna with a very large gain, or 
the, the, the problem with dual gimbal antenna is the platform uh, problem because with the dual gimbal antenna when it is moving, there is a jitter which is caused from the spacecraft. So the jitter uh, cannot be tolerated in some of the imaging payloads, especially with the high resolution payload, the jitter cannot be tolerated. So in such cases, we have to go in for an electronic phase delay. So what we did is in this case, cases and we went for an electronic phase delay. And if you have a fixed, uh, fixed antenna beam and you try to scan, beyond 60 degrees we scan, it comes to less than half. So it's not of much use. So we must have an antenna system, even if we go to plus minus 90 degrees also, we must get a sufficient signal. So what we did is we went for an active phase delay antenna system for our spacecraft. As you can see, you can see how the cell is varying. Here, the, at this stage, this is the angle. When, when it is at 90 degrees, it's like this. When it is here, it's like this. See, the tilt is different. So we need to have a change. In the, uh, the, the beam has to point always to a different direction. So we have to generate that beam using an active means. So, and also the spacecraft, not only this, in some of these imaging spacecraft, what happens is, the spacecraft need to tilt. Suppose I want to, the spacecraft is moving like this, I, I want to image a strip which is here. So, I have to change the attitude of the spacecraft in such a way that the camera which is fixed on the satellite views this. When you tilt this, this antenna which I thought was looking to the earth, it may be looking somewhere else. So, what happens is, this active phase delay which I do, we will have to make the beam in such a way that it sees the, sees the ground station of interest. Whichever ground station you select, suppose normally our ground station in touch is at NRSA Hyderabad, is our main, main station. But otherwise also there are other stations like we have a station at Delhi, we have a station at other places. Depending on which station you use, that station latitude or longitude can be given. And on board we can do the processing in such a way that directly the beam can be directed to that particular station. The command is given from the From the air station. From the air station you can give the command and then get the this thing directly to that uh, location. So that is a very important thing. So here we are actively generating the beam at, at every instant because it is not going to be constant. It keeps, it is a low earth orbiting satellite, it keeps moving. So when it keeps moving, this beam also needs to be continuously uh, formed and it should always point to the station of interest. So that is the full challenge. So we have to go in for an active phase antenna system in this case. So what we do is that we have different, and this is the frequency as I told, the frequency of interest of this. This is the specification given to us. We wanted to realize on a uh, polarization of the right hand circular polarization. Here the required was from that link calculation we find that we require a missing of the order of 22 dBA and uh, a beam width of this much or, and uh, side lobe was not very great with the and we want it from 0 to 90 degrees and then uh, zero to 360 and steerability should be electronic and weight should not be too much. Okay, initially they said that in this particular square picture they wanted two beams, they gave up to 10 degrees maximum weight and the size was what is this. These are some indicative figures for you to do the design. So this was definitely a very complex thing, but the possibility of generating multiple beam or a single beam was there. So accordingly, we had seen through various uh, structures and finally we thought the spherical structure will be the uh, best one because the spherical surface will give you a very good, uh, it's uh, basically it's highly symmetric. A spherical surface is a very symmetric one. See, in, you, you can make the same way you, using some uh, different planar arrays. What happens is, when you switch over from one planar array to another planar array, there is a gap in the data. The data break is there. The data break we don't want. So, what we want, we want to have a continuous uh, variation of the beam and the beam should be pointing to the earth always. So, we did not, we didn't go for separate ones. So, we had to go for generation of the beam for at the, to the required station of interest. And then the beam, since the you know, uh, satellite is continuously moving, so the beam needs to be generated continuously. We thought that if you generate with respect to at about every one second, that is sufficient. Because what we do is now the station is fixed, our the attitude control system will give us which is the station vector. So this is the satellite moving. Uh, it says this is the station vector. For this station vector, if we had to generate a beam, we have a processor which will generate a beam in this direction. So, to generate a beam in this direction, what happens is, we use a number of elements, those many elements will be switched on with the required amplitude and phase and it will generate a beam. And this will keep on varying every second. For how long? One second? Uh, every second is the update because it is no longer there. No, after that it changes. 
So every second we get an update from the system and you get new and more and more beams generated. So we use the spherical tracer rate for this thing. So electronic beam saving has been the most elegant way of doing that. And the major advantage is electronic beam that does not reduce any jitter on the platform. That's the greatest advantage we have. It just doesn't have any jitter on the platform. And uh, we can have a single beam or multiple beam depending on the requirement. And the also this is the active array concept and the DC power also, only problem here is the DC power. Because we have to have a large number of uh, elements and each element need to be powered separately. So, to, so that you have a very good control of the whole thing. So the DC power requirement is high because of the amplifier involved. Some of the circuits we used, we started uh, using for last three, four circuits we used. And this anyway I told the planar array, they have a limitation of the this one we found best is the spherical array. So finally we made an antenna of this nature. A spherical array, e, we know the frequency of interest is x band. So each element, what we did is we made out of a helix. E, each element, you can see each element is made of a helix. And each of these helix antenna is connected to a, uh, because for phase shifting you require a phase shifter and you require a amplifier for each. So what an amplifier come phase shifter was made, this is one each of these unit is an amplifier, uh, amplifier come phase shifter made out of MMIC because otherwise the size will be big. So it is all made out of MMIC. So this MMIC uh, micro monolithic micro circuit which is directly used on the each one is separately connected to one and from there it goes to a, uh, a power combiner and then the, there is a processor. That processor only will uh, say at any time how many of these beams will be on, how many of these elements will be active and what is its amplitude and phase. Accordingly, the beam will get generated. Now, suppose the satellite is in this direction, there is no point in switching beams which are on the back side. You switch on the beams only those elements they are likely to contribute. So, you switch on only these elements and, and that so that you will get a beam in this direction. So what we do is we generate, we, we have an algorithm in such a way, we will say that this is, if this is the beam direction, you, you throw open a particular angle, within that angle, whatever is the elements, you switch on those elements. And for each of these elements, if the beam direction is this direction, what it should be the amplitude and phase. All those things it computes and that processor gives the command to each of the phase shift amplifier as to what should be the phase shift amplifier, is a phase shifter is a digital phase shifter. So directly it will get, get the, because the 5 bit phase shifter easily you can uh, control within 11 and a half degrees, which is not a problem at all. So we uh, set the values and then we get the beam generated. Once the beam is generated one direction, at next second, because of one minute, uh, one second is too large a time for a processor, no problem, it's 1000 milliseconds. So after every 1000 milliseconds it has to update, it's not at all a problem, so it will update. So next minute when the satellite has moved out, I need to move, I need to decide now direction required is here. So this set of beams will come. Similarly, uh, at every instant the different set of beams will come depending on what sort of, suppose you are looking at the nadir, that is your right off, then only this one, the few ones which are on the top, that will only be seen. All the side ones is of not of much use. So we will switch on only those which are nearby and with that we will get the required beam. So each of this amplifier is connected to each of these antennas are connected to a phase shift amplifier and then in turn to a divider and then to a processor and the processor will control as to how the beam will get generated. Now this is the actual hardware, this is the, the first time we made in, uh, here and we flew that also. The beam sharing antenna gives the, receives the beam, wow, this is the beam point in direction, telemeters the process data and also gives it to the ground station. Because we know, want to know which station, this is actually a small block diagram, this is the uh, radiating helix, this is the amplifier which is a phase shift amplifier, and then this is a divider, and this, this is the, uh, because this is the transmission side, so from the transmitter output it goes to this, transmitter output, power divider, then goes to the phase shift amplifier, then goes to individual helices. And then there are some control circuits which will shape which amplifier will be made on, which amplifier will be made off, etc. This is a control circuit which causes it. That's a very simple processor, only 8086 processor would do because the amount of function which it has to do is not very much. So, a yeah, simple 8086 processor will do. So, that's how we have done this uh, active surgery. This is one great advantage is you have got the great flexibility. Whatever be the size of the beam you want, you can uh, have. Whichever direction you want, you can generate 
all those things, the total flexibility is in your hands. That is the great advantage. That is why it's called an active residue. You, you, because you, you, at every time, the same beam is not there. Different beams are coming at different times. Okay. So this was a great challenge when it was given for the first time to us. This is also a, yeah, this one, the artistic tracing of the whole system. Uh, whatever I showed that, the same thing is given here. So here, this article, the, we know this is the array of antennas. And then this is a phase shift amplifier, main six way divider, driver amplifiers, beam steering electronics. This is a beam steering electronics will house the required processes and that. Here we put two because we wanted to have a redundancy because electronics means one immediately one redundancy will uh, say because for some reason or other processor hands, what will you do? See nowadays of course they do mitigation technique by putting a watchdog timer. The moment the processor doesn't uh, respond for some time, you put a watchdog timer that within which time it doesn't have it will reset the processor. That is how normally nowadays they do. They, that is one of the best techniques which has happened in many of the systems. But in some reason it is failed because because of one processor failure, you cannot completely jeopardize the mission. So major electronics of this nature they have redundancy. But an antenna, if you have to put two antennas, it's too huge. Nowhere, two antennas are used. It's very huge. So as, as far as possible, there are some critical elements are like here SSPA. SSPA also SPA rail <coughs> elements, these things you can have redundancy. They are all small, small elements. There is nothing wrong in having one more unit being there. And uh, so these things are all actually these driver amplifiers, etc. And other uh, MMAC modules, we are getting it done through uh, this company in Hyderabad called Gatek. That is actually Gatek was nothing but original SCL of Chandigarh. Had another, Chandigarh was doing on uh, silicon technology. Whereas this SCL which, uh, which came to Hyderabad, they were doing on Gallimersen technology. Later they could do it on the, this one now they are called Gallimersen technology center. <coughs> And they do all sorts of MOICs, etc. by S, X, C, K, U, whatever band you want, they do. So they will do at uh, this level and then give you the total amplifier and that can be found. It is a, now it's a very unique company. Now, so great advantage is we are able to use the Indian infrastructure for such a sophisticated uh, system. So the full system as I showed you, it looks like this is an active reservoir and uh, these are the uh, amplifier, this one. This, this first set of amplifiers which we bought, we couldn't get from GATAC at that particular time because it was immediately required. So only this spaceship amplifier we imported, but all of the engineering we did ourselves. The next uh, satellite onwards, we got this also from the from India. So this is actually the whole phase antenna system is sitting on the vibration table because we had to make sure the whole system which withstands the launch vibration. So. So we did that, uh, so this on the vibration table. You see the amount of hardness is quite a bit because this is a thing. And here also you see these cables. Each of these is a phase match cable. Each one has to be phase, phase match cable because we are assuming that the phase reaching at these places are all constant, same phase. In many cases it is not so. So as far as possible, we wanted to make sure the phase is reaching same. Otherwise if it is not there, what we do is we found that uh, whatever way you do, finally the phasing is look, uh, coming to be different. So what we did is, we made a lookup table and found out what are the phases in each of them and accordingly that much of phase offset you give to the amplifier. Otherwise unnecessarily the beam will not get generated properly. So that uh, particular, that was a very important uh, yeah, this thing which we did. So at the time before you connect to the amplifier you see what is the phase shift and that phase shift uh, you know you know, and then uh, make a uh, lookup table with which you can change over, to, uh, you, to, you can give the offset as per requirement. So this is the, now once you have made the antenna, you have to test without, uh, because antenna half the time or more is, uh, goes for the testing. So you can, here you can see an anechoic chamber, we have fixed the phase array antenna system and connected all these things to the uh, required electronics, all these electronics we did put on top, we have put it below and this is an anechoic chamber on which is fixed and this fixture also we have made some very special fixture. How do you test it? Here we know the beam will get generated at different locations. How will you test that beam is coming correctly? So first if it is a naughty, if it is a straight beam coming directly like this, yes you detect. After that the beam changes to this direction, how will you take it? So we must have a positioning system which can rotate, which can be, which can come to any direction we want. So this fixture itself was a special fixture we made with which we could rotate this whole structure to the dire required direction. So what we did is after that, you, you saw that that is the bare antenna, after this the thermal engineer, he wanted to make sure that the 
if this is a very large this thing, you know, from there, a lot of thermal energy can get into the spacecraft. So it has to be protected. So this protection is done using a thermal blanket. See, we have a thermal blanket. See, this is called a thermal blanket. This is got this is nothing but a quad. In this particular case, it is a quad wool. On on top of the quad wool, it is the Captain sheet. So this plus that together, and this whole thing is completely transparent to RF. So after the dress up, we have again checked it out. So because after you do all these things, if it doesn't work in onboard, it's a problem. No? So it is after this is a fully dress up uh, unit which is ready for uh, delivery to the spacecraft. So here this one is the board work on which this is fixed, and then the whole thing is tested in that uh, antenna test range which I showed there. So first, suppose we are tested here, if, if, if it is directly pointing, this beam is generated. Now after that, when I want to shift, I, uh, the next time we want beam like this. So the beam, we have to make sure the beam is like this. So from the processor, from the ground, you give a command so that this beam needs to be generated. So once this beam is generated, we also may have to make sure that we are receiving in that direction correctly. So you make the positioning system move in such a way. See here, what we do is. Here, uh, this one you can directly see the other side will have the uh, uh, receiving uh, antenna. Here, once the beam is formed from this uh, from this area, it will be somewhere here. So, what we do is we rotate this uh, uh, structure in such a way that this beam comes up. You, you can offset that uh, structure so that the main beam of that will come to in line with the other uh, receiving antenna. There. So, how much you have tilted there that we can know from the encoder which is fixed onto this. So this angle and the angle which you have commanded should match. So that is how we did the testing and plotted onto the graph. So what we do is a different command we gave and at different locations we got the B. So just to check whether they are coming at proper direction. So that whenever we knew when we did the beam switching, it will directly come to this. So both directions we did and then plotted onto the graph. This is a very important thing. It is a very large experimentation which you need to do the, to get this beam generated and then to verify them. Verification is a very important thing because after you go, you find that you ask for 30 degrees off, if it doesn't come to 30 degrees, it goes somewhere else, then it's useless, absolutely useless. So that is a very great challenge which we done and this one, this one is looking so big in this, this is the first satellite when we did, it was this size. From this was about 30 kg weight, from this we brought down to nearly, in the second uh, unit which we did came to about 25 kg, 20-22 uh, kg. Then the third satellite we brought it down to about 10.5 kg and that we have flown in already two of them. So this one we slowly from 30 kg we have come down already to almost 10-10.5 kg. So that is how the, once you do everything yourself, it is easy for us to do the engineering also. See, in fact, initially when we wanted to do, because it's a very new system which needs to be done, we thought, okay, we will also look for an alternative. Suppose you do and it doesn't work. At the end of the May, uh, at the end when the satellite is about to launch, you cannot say we cannot give an antenna which will give the required uh, pattern. It is not possible. No, it's, so what we did is as a part of the planning, we also went in for a, a export. For, expo, for not for export, I asked for import of the unit. So for that we asked for proposals. But the proposals, when we sent the proposals, we hardly got response. But one or two companies which we responded also, uh, they were not fully satisfying us. But even one company which was nearly satisfying our uh, requirement was costing more than 55 crores. Cost of the antenna, 55 crores. Not now, it is as late as uh, about, uh, about seven, eight years back. 55 crores was the cost of the antenna and, uh, and not fully meeting our requirement. So we thought uh, we should give a try ourselves and we only, in this for the first unit when we uh, imported this uh, active phase amplifiers in MMIC module, that costed us about 2 crores. That is the only investment we made in this. All of the engineering, this, that, etc., we have done ourselves. Even if we take all our manpower plus these facilities, etc., which we have used, we can add about 2 to 3 crores. So we can say that the whole thing we have done in about 5 to 6 crores of rupees compared to the 57 or 58 crores which we would have paid if we had imported that. And if we had imported that, we would have not known the full details. See here we know the hardware, the software, this, that, everything, it is within, it is, everything is in-house. We know every bit, anything we want we can change that. So here that is why from this 30 kg we can brought down as much as, as low as 10 kg. If you, the same thing, if you ask that company, he will do it, no doubt, but he will uh, charge you like anything. 
so that is a great advantage of having our own uh, method of doing that thing so this we can do it if someone wants it we can give no problem absolutely but to make this this is a self reliant thing which we did so this was a very great challenge which was posed for the all this thing and more than anything is after you make it to exactly test and this testing was we had done it in the anagak chamber using that uh, special positioner which was designed and that positioner along with the regular thing and then every time you give a, a required beam generation you have to make sure that it is coming to the correct location you calculate this using the beam width as well as the arp which you use all those things and then you tabulate and make an exhaust result i have just given a sample out here see here in that particular one we wanted even some two beam generation so they we are given commanding to give a have a and at 20 degrees angle one beam 30 degrees angle another beam similarly at 60 degrees at one beam 30 degrees another beam so likewise we generated various beams to make sure that the beam can be generated at the locations of interest because you can have you know suppose we want to receive simultaneously at suppose say gauhati and uh, uh, hyderabad one beam can be towards gauhati one beam can be towards hyderabad similarly if you are to receive at delhi and uh, hyderabad one beam can be at delhi one beam can be at hyderabad but uh, in the first mission only we did that but subsequently we found that it is not required to have two simultaneous this thing because we thought that one station can receive and the other station you can always have a link there are so many links available within india itself there are so many links available and the data need not be unnecessarily spread to various other places so that is why we did in this case of course because these are all data rates the data rates of the order of 100 megabits are so here it can be much higher there is no problem in this Uh, only great this thing is the, the type of data is so very important that it cannot be spilled over to any other region so it goes only to a specific station and the data is also encrypted and the decryption key is given only to the specific station which receives it and the decryption key is not same on all the disks it keeps varying so they have a, our digital group they have done a work in such a way that the decryption key can be continuously changed and every day and that is known only to the station which is receiving it and it is not same every day it keeps changing so that the secrecy also the data also is maintained and someone else cannot receive it even if they receive the data they cannot use uh, do much about it because the data is uh, you you cannot break the key this is a difficult now of course nowadays there are special methods with which you can keep breaking the key but if you break the key also you only one day you may get next day your data is different you have to again run through to get the key so it is a very important thing so this is a very strategic uh, it's an imp- important uh, this one you know, can see the beam how nice it is generated in two different directions this is the uh, scheme which we have used here it comes to various to get that uh, this is required number of switches these are prepared etc these are all speedy switches all this is everything now we are able to do it in india either uh, mostly the one of the major workhorse for uh, electronics is in hyderabad hyderabad has got fantastic facilities for making a, there are a lot of uh, private industry were also there one is uh, getak esk of course is under the this is government public sector but is the other one that uh, astra microwave or any other companies there are so many private companies who can do uh, work rf work in hyderabad of course many of them we do ourselves in same house but the number is large we even do it outside so this is the other side you see you see how the it is mounted and see this is a special stand which is made this is a lanthanum which is mounted this is the next version of that you can see it is much smaller size 